Greetings, respective viewers. I'm George from Ireland. Behind me is my bicycle, uh, and indeed a statue of William Huskisson. But uh, he is the topic that I propose to address. So, William Huskisson has the dubious distinction of being the first person ever killed by a train. Uh, Huskisson was born in 1770. Uh, I'm just trying to think where it was born because, oh yes, it was born in um, Malvern, uh, Gloucestershire. But both his parents were from Staffordshire, if I've got that right. So it was very much of the Midlands. His family had been, they'd been minor landowners for, for several generations in that part of the country. He went to a school in Leicestershire uh, called um, Appleby. I think it's pronounced Appleby, not Appleby. There's another um, Appleby, which is further north, but th this particular one. So, um, he, he had three brothers, four brothers. He had several siblings when his mother died and his father remarried. Um, so there was something in his background to think that he would rise to great political prominence. He didn't go to the top public schools or university. They were not especially wealthy, better off than most people. A lot of, a lot of people lived in what we now consider dire penury. Anyway, when he was an adolescent, he was sent to live with his um, maternal uncle in, in um, France. He were, his uncle was the uh, physician to the British Embassy. And so as a teenager, he witnessed the events of the French Revolution, um, which made him uh, exceptionally inquisitive about all matters political. And during his nine years in France, he acquired mastery of the French language. Um, so. Uh, he was initially a supporter of the French Revolution. He was horrified that by the way he got out, got out of hand. He thought France ought to become a, a constitutional monarchy on the British model. And many French moderates felt likewise. Yes, they could have a king. Uh, virtually every country in the world had a monarch. It was difficult to conceive of a country without a monarch. Obviously, the United States didn't have one. That was very exceptional and perceived as being on the edge of the civilized world by Europeans back then. There were micro-states which didn't have monarchs. Some of the uh, German or, or Italian city-states where they thought republicanism had gone out years ago uh, and indeed he addressed a public meeting on uh, les assignats which is which is a type of tax which is thought to be particularly pernicious and regressive um, in published articles likewise uh, so he, he, this brought him to the attention of um, the Marcus of Stafford who was uh, one of the uh, major landowners in the part of the United Kingdom that he hailed from as in Staffordshire that's why the man had the, um, the, the title Lord Stafford uh, so he acquired him as a patron, and indeed he, uh, his, his deeds reached the ears of Pitt the Younger, who became Prime Minister in 1783 uh, for the first time. Um, so this 24-year-old was um, impressed by this uh, young uh, sprightly chap, uh, this young stripling who was such a thrusting young blade, so clever, and um, didn't have really a background to help him. So you needed money in those days. He represented a number of different constituencies, Liverpool towards the end, um, because only about 5% of men were allowed to vote back then. So there were some pocket boroughs where it was effectively in the pocket of uh, whoever owned most of the property around there saying, you've got to vote for my candidate or else I'll sack you or evict you. And there were, pocket, there were boroughs with, with say as few as, as 12 men could vote, things like that. There were some boroughs like Westminster where, where most men could vote, there'd be several thousand electors. Anyway, he came back here and he threw himself into Tory politics. Though um, whether Pitt the Younger was a Tory is somewhat debatable, as he came from a Whig family, and his supporters often called Pittites. Though the word Tory was, was seen as an insult by the 1780s. But here, just as it was in the United States, is only after the 1800 that Tories are out and proud, in most cases, about being Tories. There was no formal party membership. You, you didn't join the party as such. There was no membership document. There was no statement of beliefs or policies. Um, anyway, he held a number of cabinet positions, Secretary of State for War and Colonies. That was the same, because you don't say Secretary of State for War, you say Secretary of State for Defense these days. Um, and uh, President of the Board of Trade towards the end. So he's an enthusiast for railway travel. Now, since the late 19th century, there've been, there been rails, so particularly underground these mining these mines to get the the, the coal the, up the, the shaft you put it onto some little cart have it pulled by a pit pony um, and a donkey or even a person because obviously there's less friction and it goes a lot faster it's a lot easier to pull the load there are also locomotives outside on the land and they were very powerful but incredibly slow so they could they could pull, pull as heavy a weight as many drays um, like a Clydesdale or something, 
um, they could pull a weight up a hill or something like that. So we, we described them in horsepower. Which kind of horse? How big is this horse? Obviously horses get tired. Well, these things have to be refueled in a while. And then George Stevenson, that, that engineer from, from Northumbria, he had the idea, put the two together. Let's put the locomotive on the, this, on the um, rails or the steam engine on the rails. Put the two together. Be a lot faster. Um, so he did that in 1825. The rocket, as he called it, first went and it was in, it was in Stockton da to Darlington, that railway. That's in northeast England. You might have thought it was London or one of the more affluent areas of the country, but no. There were a lot of coal mines up there, hence there were a lot of rails. So the, although a Frenchman hit upon the same idea at roughly the same time, so arguably as a Frenchman came up with it first, I'm not quite sure about the French version of the invention. So they started spreading by like wildfire, and within 20 years, um, every even medium-sized town in the British Isles had a railway station. So um, the uh, Liverpool Railway, Liverpool to Manchester Railway was about to open. Now he was already suffering various health problems with his kidneys and so on. Um, and he went along to see this opening. The, uh, the Duke of Wellington was there, was the hero of Waterloo, the, the future Prime Minister and various other um, dignitaries. One of the worthies was, was Sir Robert Peel, I think, though no royal personages were present. And it was on one train, which had been driven by, by Stevenson himself, and then the other train is approaching. Was it, was it the Rocket? I can't remember who was riding, or was it Northumbrian? Anyway, some people um, got off the train. Um, they were advised not to alight. He was warned by his doctor he shouldn't be there. His health wasn't up to it. But he nevertheless disregarded doctor's orders and rashly went ahead with this engagement. Um, and then the other train approached and he was trying to get on to the first train to stay out of danger. But um, he had two left hands, as it were. He'd also had his arm operated on some time ago. Um, as a very mal-coordinated shot chap and um, got into a blind panic and was dithering, coming here and there, eventually hit by the train, which very badly um, uh, wounded his leg. Um, he wasn't killed outright, no, he, he um, expired several hours later, had plenty of time to dictate his last will and testament. They had thought of operating, could, 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 could they amputate his leg there and then? I don't think there was any doctor who was capable of doing it. So that is George Stevenson, and here you have in the guise of a Roman statesman. And his house in St. James has got a blue plaque on it as well. He was president of the Board of Trade when he was killed, a title that was then um, abolished and then revived by uh, Michael uh, Heseltine, a man of raging vanity, who obviously liked to see him himself in the guise of a Roman statesman as well. Uh, anyway, that's enough about William Huskisson. His statue is here in Pimlico Gardens. I'm not quite sure why. Was it owned by one of his political patrons? He wasn't that wealthy, considering he's a cabinet minister. There's the Thames, uh, just beside where we are now. What, what an absolutely gorgeous late spring day, in an idyllic temperature. Ooh, and I see a police boat going yonder. Toodaloo.